Well, good morning and welcome to worship this morning. Certainly a delight to see you here in worship with us this morning. I want to begin by sharing uh, a number of announcements with you this morning. Uh, deacons meeting is after the morning worship service today, so deacons don't forget. More uh, deacons meeting after service today. Also, our act teens are having an activity, so ladies, uh, young ladies, act teens having a social, a time together uh, after the service as well today here in the Family Life Center. Circle ladies, Mission Circle ladies, you have circle meeting tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. And Miss Donna said that if you'll come to the meeting at 10 o'clock, she will have lunch for you. So that makes it even better. So circle meeting ladies, lunch tomorrow, but come for meeting at 10 o'clock. Next Sunday is Mother's Day and uh, a special time, a special time of worship for us as we honor our mothers next Sunday. Of course, we will be having parent and child dedication time during the service that morning. So if you'd like to participate in that, just be here for that next Sunday morning as well. The following Sunday, the 16th, there is a bridal shower for Jenna Duggar, her fiance, Mike, and uh, that is two weeks from today. Um, if you have a question about that or would like to donate uh, towards that, they are collecting the funds to buy gifts. So if you'd like to do that, you can either see my wife, Paula, or Sherry, or Terry, and uh, you can help with that for the bridal shower coming up on the 16th. Then a couple of other announcements. On Sunday, July the 4th, we are going to have a special worship service at the city park. That worship service is going to be at 10 o'clock. We're going to invite our community, of course, to join us for that, uh, for music and, of course, time in the word. So you can begin to spread the word about that. But uh, we are going to have an awesome time uh, worshiping and honoring the Lord and our country. And that will be on Sunday, July the 4th, 10 o'clock over at the park. We won't have Sunday school that Sunday morning. We'll be gathering there for that special time of worship. And then Vacation Bible School. You got a letter last week uh, home with things that are going on. And I did put the wrong date for Vacation Bible School in there. But just a reminder, Vacation Bible School begins on Sunday night, July the 18th, and runs through the week. And we are looking forward to that. Our Bible school a little bit different this year. Um, we'll be having preschool and children's vacation Bible school this year. Uh, not our youth and adults, but um, we will be having children and uh, preschool Bible school coming up this year as well. So we hope that you will plan to join us for that especially great time. Also, if you've not had an opportunity to notice... We so far have 160-something pairs of shoes already donated uh, for our shoebox ministry. Miss Donna said we have ordered the first 100 of those shoes, so looking forward to that. What an awesome thing that that is. A lot of announcements. They're in our weekly church bulletin along with a few others, so make sure you get a copy of our church bulletin if you didn't yet before you leave today so that you can be aware of all the things and opportunities we have for ministry here at First Baptist. So, a joy. We're grateful that you came today. If you're here for the first time, you need to come back again. And I'm sharing that not just because we want you to come back and join us again, but most of our music team has left. Not permanently. They're on vacation in New Hampshire and yesterday they played in some snow yes they did they played in some snow they're having a great time so I only share that today that if you come and you leave and go that was different come back and join us when the music team is here but if you're visiting with us today thanks for coming to make this day special for us 
We want to give an opportunity for you to welcome and greet one another. So if you can put a smile on your face, we invite you to stand. I'll give you the opportunity to mull around and greet one another this morning if you're comfortable with that. If not, that's fine. Let's uh, share a welcome song together this morning. All right, let's greet one another. As you're going back to your places, you may be seated this morning. And we did have a great time in Sunday school this morning. Great lesson out of 2 Timothy. And uh, we hope that you are able to join us for Sunday school. First Sunday in June, we are planning to be back to our regular scheduled Sunday school classes, so gearing up for that, coming up real soon. So thanks for joining us for Bible study this morning. If you didn't, join us next week. I invite you to join me as we approach the Lord's throne room this morning in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful that we have a place to come and worship today that your presence is here with us. And the reason we've gathered is to worship you today. And I pray that in the next few minutes we'll be able to put aside the cares of our lives, things that are going on, and put our focus on you. And I pray that as we do that today, whether it's in song or prayer, in our giving, our fellowship, our time in your word, that'll come from genuine hearts. That we came for you more than anything else. That we came to glorify you. We came to lift up Jesus Christ. We came to share your precious word. And to leave having worshipped you different in our own lives. Thank you for being here with us today. Father, I pray for our music team as they are away, that you'll give them a great time of rest and relaxation and fellowship together, Lord. Bring them home safe to us. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for your word. And I pray that as we worship you today, you're glorified in Jesus name amen all right you had your choice between listening to me lead your worship today or we had our praise team record some of my favorite songs so if you're comfortable standing or sitting whatever you feel comfortable we're going to share three of my favorite songs this morning
so grateful for them being able to record that. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. Our message today is entitled, A Life of Influence. A Life of Influence. We're going to be looking briefly 
at the beginning of King Hezekiah's rule. Think about what influences we have on our lives and what kind of influence we are going to be on others' lives. It fits so well with our Sunday school lesson this morning in 2 Timothy with Paul as a mentor to Timothy and Timothy a pastor there at the church in Ephesus and God reminding him of the influence that he has had on Timothy's life and the influence that Timothy is to have on other people's lives. 2 Kings chapter 18, we're going to be looking at the first six verses today, and when you find that place in your copy of God's Word, I would invite you out of reverence to God's Word to bow your head with me this morning. I'd invite you to bow your heart as well. And take the next few moments of quiet meditation and invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments in silent prayer. Then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text for today. Father, I know that I can approach your throne room today because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That the grace that you gave me was completely undeserved. But you loved us so much. Thank you for the privilege of knowing that one day I will spend eternity in heaven. And as we Spend time in your word this morning, Father. I pray that we would hear from you, not from me. And I pray that as you share the message with each one of us here today, that we'd not just be hearers, but we'd be obedient as well. Bless the time that we have in your precious word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse number 1, the Bible says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty-five years was he when he began to reign. And he reigned for twenty-nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, short for Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his David, his father, had done. For he removed the high places, he broke the images, he cut down the idols, he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clung to the Lord, and he departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, the ones that God had commanded Moses. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. A life of influence. No doubt you have had people that have influenced you in your life. No doubt you are an influence on other people's lives. A true story from the life of G. Brooke Adams. G. Brooke Adams kept a diary from his boyhood. Every day he kept his diary. When he was eight years old, during that time he was eight, he had the opportunity, a rare opportunity, to spend the day with his father, and they went fishing. He recorded in his diary on that day, I quote, went fishing with my father, best day of my life. His father was Charles Francis Adams who was the United States ambassador to Great Britain under President Abraham Lincoln. 
after his father passed away, he found his father's diary. And over the next several weeks, he began to go through that diary. And over the course of time, as he went through that diary, he remembered some of the special times in his life, and he remembered that day he went fishing with his father when he was eight years old. And he looked back through his father's very well-kept, precise diary and actually found the day that his dad had recorded, the one day the two of them had gone fishing, and his dad's diary said this, went fishing with my son didn't accomplish anything. His had said, went fishing with my father, best day of my life. And his father said, went fishing with my son, didn't accomplish anything. That's a unique perspective on influence, isn't it? But I'd like to take these six verses. I want to give you three points about influence, and I hope you'll write them down. I hope you'll go back to God's Word this week and dig into it a little bit deeper and see what else God has for you. But I want us to look at first the influence of family, then the influence of society, and then the influence of God. The influence of family, the influence of society, and the influence of God. In verse number one, we find there that there is a man named Hoshea who is the king of Israel when Hezekiah was the king of Judah. Remember, at this time in the history of Israel, the nation has been divided for some time. And Hoshea is the king in the northern kingdom, often called Israel. And Hezekiah becomes the king in the southern kingdom, usually referred to as Judah. Both kings at the same time, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Hezekiah, it is told to us, is the son of Ahaz. Ahaz was the king before Hezekiah. There's something you need to know about Hezekiah's father, though. He did not receive his godly influence from his father. In fact, his father, King Ahaz, was a very, very evil king. So evil that he would close the temple in Jerusalem and not allow any worship there. He would worship idols publicly. His father in worship to one of those idols, would take his young son and cast him into the fire that burned for that idol and sacrifice his own little boy to an idol god. He did not receive his godly influence from his father. And at the age of 25, he began to reign as king, and it tells us he would reign for 29 years. If you know the story of Hezekiah, you will know that in the middle of those 29 years, Hezekiah would become very, very ill. And Isaiah, the prophet, would come to Hezekiah, the same Isaiah that we have the book on, and the same Isaiah who would preach to his father Ahaz to no avail, But that same Isaiah would come to Hezekiah and say, you better get all your family and all your things in order because you are going to die. And Hezekiah would beg God to heal him. And we know the story that God would heal Hezekiah, another sermon. He would heal Hezekiah, and Hezekiah would go on to reign for 15 more years, a total of 29 years. His, God, his father was not godly, but his mother's name was Abby, in this case. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29, you find the same account of the story of Hezekiah. His mother's name used in its full there, uh, Abijah, which means Jehovah is my father. He didn't have a godly father, but he had a godly mother. His mother's father, we're told, was Zechariah. Now, lest you think it's the same Zechariah that has the book Zechariah, it's not. 
In fact, if you study the Old Testament, it can get rather confusing because there are over 30 Zacharias in the Old Testament. This, act, this Zechariah, who was his mother's father, was a godly man, a priest and a prophet, both. And that godly influence was passed down to Nehemiah. And I only share that to share one more point before we go on to the next one. I don't know where your godly influence came from, if you had any godly influence from family. You're here today, and obviously God means something to you. But I don't know where your godly influence came, or if there was a godly influence in your family, but I will tell you this, every single family needs at least one godly influence. You might be it. And if you are, thank God for you. But every family needs one solid, godly influence. And I would invite you in a little bit when we have our invitation today, I would invite you to come to this altar and say, God, whether anybody else in my family will, I will be a godly influence. I will be the kind of person that my children, my grandchildren, my nieces, my nephews, whoever it is in my extended family, I will be the one solid godly influence in their life. The influence of family is very important. Second one I want us to look at is the influence of society. I love what it says in verse number three, that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. By the way, that phrase is only told of two other kings in all of the southern kingdom. Only three of the kings in the southern kingdom does it say they did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And those two other kings are Asa, who ruled a long time, and Josiah, who was the youngest godly king. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. I want to share one principle about that though, before you go, though. It's pretty unique. In fact, I've studied Asa. I've studied Josiah. I love Josiah. I've studied Hezekiah. Somehow in all of it, I missed one particular point about each one of those three guys that the Bible says they did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. The only three kings it records, all three of them had one thing in common. All three of them had evil fathers. All three of them had evil fathers. But there was a godly influence in their life. Remember Timothy in Sunday school this morning? He had a godly grandmother and a godly mother. That influence of family, somebody's got to be it. But the influence of society. In verse number four, it says he removed the high places. That concept is told often in the Old Testament. They would set up idols. They would set them up in their yards. They would set them up in places of prominence in the city. They would set them up in places of prominence out along the roads where there'd be a little knoll or a little hill and they would put an idol on that thing for people to worship. They were called those high places. They would sometimes set them in beautiful gardens and in the trees and they would make those places for people to stop and worship idols. And it was widespread in Hezekiah's time. The vast majority of people that lived in the southern kingdom of Judah worshipped idols. And they were everywhere. And when Hezekiah becomes king, he does that which is right in the sight of the Lord, and he begins to remove all of them. He begins to cast them down. He begins to cut them down. He begins to destroy all all of them. He cuts them down. He breaks them into pieces. And then there's a unique thing that's found here where it says in verse number four that he also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Now it's really a unique reference. If you don't know the story, I'll only give it to you briefly because of time today. But in the as the Israelites left Egypt and they were wandering for those 40 years in the wilderness, 
there were many things that happened to them. There were many things that they did wrong that God would punish them for. One of those stories in the book of Numbers, God sends venomous vipers to bite them. And people are dying. And they realize that it's come from judgment from God. And Moses begs God to do something. And God says to Moses, make a brass, a bronze serpent and raise it up. And anybody that looks at it will be healed and saved. It's an amazing picture. It's an awesome sermon. We talked about the old rugged cross and Jesus being raised on a hill. We talked about idols set up on hills. We talked about that brazen serpent that if it was raised up and they just looked to it, they'd be saved. Just like looking to that old rugged cross that Jesus hung on. It's an awesome story. You've got to go back and check it out in Numbers 21, not now. Stay away from the snakes during this sermon. But here's the point. Moses made that brass serpent when they were wandering in the wilderness. If you know your Bible history at all, and you begin thinking in your mind, you realize that when Hezekiah broke it into pieces, it was... 700 years after Moses had made it. 700 years they had kept that. And the people had begun to worship that. Hezekiah called it Nehushtan, which means little brass thing. They were worshiping that idol. They had taken, listen to me, they had taken that something God had designed for good and turned it into something that God had not intended it to be for. Oh man, there's another sermon. We might be here a long time today. They were worshiping idols. My definition of an idol is anything. You put before God anything you put before God. And over 700 years, they had turned something that God had determined and had created for good, and they had turned it into something that God had not designed it to be, and they were doing what the book of Romans tells us, that they were worshiping the creation, not the creator. Everybody did it. There weren't little pockets of people who were idolaters in the nation. It was widespread. Society had accepted them worshiping idols. In fact, we already know it had gotten so bad that they were so into idol worship that Hezekiah's own father Ahaz had taken Hezekiah's little brother and thrown him in a fire and burned him and killed him for an idol. That's what society was. That was the influence of society in Hezekiah's time. The temple shut down. Idol worship everywhere. And for some reason, people tend to think that if everybody's doing it, it must be okay. Sound familiar? It sure does. And Hezekiah breaks it into pieces. Wow. You see, I, you look at the story of Hezekiah and you realize that I'm grateful he had at least one godly influence in his life and his family. He also had Isaiah as a mentor as well, but he had one godly influence. And I am grateful that there was a king named Hezekiah who, unlike all of his other peers and unlike all of the rest of society, he decided, I will stand and do what's right. If nobody else in the world will do it, I will do what's right. And I will ask you for that commitment today. 
that despite what society says, okay, despite what everybody else is doing, even anybody else inside the church, if God says no, I say no, and if God says yes, I say yes, and I will be the one that will stand and do what's right, whether anybody else in the world will do it. Because you and I have the influence of society all around us. How many people were ever heard from your mom or dad something similar to this? If all your friends did, how many have ever heard that before? Yeah, most of us. I remember the first time I ever heard it. I remember my mom saying, if all your friends went down to the lake and jumped off the bridge, would you? Wrong answer. <laughs> then it got changed to Cliff. Then as a 23-year-old, I got to go to New York, outside of Horseheads, New York, near Elmira, to a quarry that had a 65-foot cliff, two to water. And my friends were doing it. And I thought to myself, if my mother was here, she'd say, if all your friends jump off that cliff, will you? And I'd have went, wrong answer again. But you understand the concept that we get this society thing around us. And we find ourselves saying, well, if everybody's doing it, it's really going to be okay. And Hezekiah is one person who says, I will not do it. I will not worship idols. I will cut them all down. I'll destroy them. I'll even break into pieces the one thing that God had Moses make that was designed for good. I'll break it into pieces because you've now changed. Wow. So I will ask you in the invitation time today, say, I'm willing. If nobody else in this church congregation is willing, I'm willing that I will do what's right. If nobody else in society will, I will. But then we see the influence of God. If you know your Bible, you know that in 2 Kings chapter 18, the book of 2 Kings and the book of 2 Chronicles are kind of like the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John share the story of Jesus, each from a little different perspective. 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles share most of the same stories and history together. So in 2 Kings 18 and 2 Chronicles 29, you have the same story about Hezekiah. Except in 2 Chronicles, it gives us a little bit more information about Hezekiah. And it tells us there that in the first year of his reign, he did that which was right in the sight of God and began to destroy all of those idols in high places. In the first year. But before he did that, he did something else. He reopened the temple for worship. You've you got to read 2 Chronicles 29, not now. Save the snakes and all that for later. But he reopened the temple. He invited the priests to come back to the temple to administer the worship there. And it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 9 that Hezekiah made a commitment to God. He said, I made a covenant with God. And he reinstated the Passover that they had not done for many years. He brought back worship to the temple. He brought back sacrifice for the people's sins. He also did one other thing. This is not for you. Dear Praise Team, having fun in New Hampshire without your preacher, playing in the snow without your preacher, Hezekiah also did one other thing that hadn't happened in church for a long time. He brought music back. I just want you to know that I love you guys. I'm grateful for you. So when you hear this on a recording later, no, we missed you, and we love you, and we count you a valuable part of our church. Amen. 
It even records that he brought music back. Can you imagine that there was a time they stopped doing music and they stopped doing sacrifice and they even shut the doors of the temple? And Hezekiah said, no, we're going to open the doors. We're going to bring back worship. We're going to bring back music. And we're going to begin to sacrifice because we are a sinful people. And you're not going to believe what happens. When one person, albeit a king, but when one person says, I will stand up and I will do what is right, the nation follows him. And they begin to repent. And revival breaks out in the whole land of Judah. And people are getting right with God and they're confessing their sins. And they're coming to Jerusalem, it tells us in 2 Chronicles, they're coming to Jerusalem in throngs to sacrifice because they have not sacrificed for their sins. And they're coming to Jerusalem to do it. And it records there are so many people, so many sins, that they didn't have enough priests to even handle all of the sacrifice that need to happen for the people. They had to wait in line. And they had to wait till there were enough priests and enough animals to do all of the sacrifice for all of the people. And I was thinking about that thinking, man, that must have been some kind of sight to see all those people waiting to confess their sin and to sacrifice for their sins and to do all of that and the priests doing all of that and music being there the whole time. Man, that must have been incredible. But then I got to thinking, what if I was there and I was in the back of the line? And something happened. And I didn't make it. Well, they ran out of animals. But there weren't enough priests to get to me. Oh, and then this verse comes. One of the most incredible verses in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews where it tells us that Jesus Christ came as the Lamb of God, the sacrifice for sins. Listen to this. And he died once. For all. And it doesn't matter what you've done in your life. It doesn't matter how much sin you've done in your life. Jesus came. He died on that old rugged cross. He shed his blood and he died so you and I could have forgiveness. So he could be our sacrifice, our substitute. And he could do it for me and for you. And that's what he did it for. Because God loves us. And if you and I are willing to look, to trust, God says he'll forgive your sin. It doesn't matter how much there is. God has enough love, enough forgiveness, enough grace for you. And if you're willing, one, to tell God that you're sorry for your sin, confess it. Tell him, God, I'm sorry. And you're willing to trust his son, Jesus Christ, as the way, as the sacrifice and the way. And you're willing to give God your life. At that moment, God will forgive your sin, adopt you as his child, and give you a home in heaven for all of eternity. You don't have to wait in line. You don't have to wonder whether there's enough. God will forgive you. And if you're not sure about your relationship with God, if you don't know that you're going to spend eternity in heaven... That's another part of our invitation today. I'll be right down here in the front. And if you'd like to know more about it, you'd like to make sure today that you know you're a child of God, we want to take a few minutes and sit down with you and talk to you about it before you go today. We'd love to show you from God's Word how you can know that. Wow. Huh. Verse number 6, the Bible says that Hezekiah clung to the Lord. It wasn't a passing thing. It wasn't I did this on Sunday morning because I felt moved to be closer to God. He clung to the Lord. How do we know? The writer tells us because he followed the commandments and he kept them. You see, Hezekiah had an influence in his life. 
even with the horrible society influence around him, he decided he would stand for what was right. I had a number of influences in my life that were godly influences. I am grateful for all of them. It took a bunch of those influences for this guy. But I'm grateful for him. Let me close with another true story. He was 14 years old. His report card said, the Marcy boy is a bad boy. That was his teacher's comment at the end of the year. He's a bad boy. Some of his other report cards had these words in it. Hopeless. Another person had written, bound to go to ruin. One teacher summed it up this way, said, tragically, very poor soil. And another one even labeled him bad, clear through. A new teacher came to the school. Oh, he'd been told about the Marcy boy. But he decided that no soil is completely devoid. And so he began to sow little seeds of love and trust and confidence. And somehow at the age of 14, it began to take a little root. And they began to see a tiny bit of change in him. He actually began to turn in some homework. And he made good passing grades. And high school came and he continued to do better and better and excel. He'd even go to college and graduate from college with honors. Huh. In 1812, he would become an associate justice with the United States Supreme Court. He would become a United States Senator, then a governor of New York and become Secretary of State. And when he retired, it was written of him, William L. Marcy. Two words, served faithful. Not necessarily a biblical setting, but you understand the setting of influence. Somebody in your family needs to be a godly example, and I hope you'll say me. Somebody needs to say whether anybody else in society will stand up and do what's right, I will. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, you can, and we'd love to talk to you about it before you go today. I'll be right here at the front. Just come and say, Pastor, I don't know. I've got questions. I'd like to know. And we'll sit down for a few minutes and open God's word and show you how you can know. What kind of influence will you be? Jesus paid the sacrifice. What about influence? Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning? Heads bowed. Invitation is pretty simple this morning. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, we would love to talk to you about it today. One of the greatest truths after finding out that God really loved me and that Jesus died for me was that I could know that I was a child of God. 
And I made that decision in my life to trust Jesus Christ. I told him I was sorry for all of my sin, and I invited him into my life, and I gave him my life. And God saved me, changed me, adopted me. If you know that you're a child of God today, it's simple. Would you be willing to come today and say, I will be the godly influence in my family? Just between you and God here at the front. Or, I will be the one who stands for what is right in society, whether anybody else does. Father, I pray that you bless our invitation time now. May we be willing to be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning. As our instrumentalist begins to play, our invitation's open. I invite you to come this morning. God, I'll be that godly influence in my family. God, I'll be the influence in my society, whether anybody else will. Come on. for worshiping with us today. I pray that you'll be the godly influence, not only in your family, but in society. We need them. We desperately need them. A lot of things going on. If you didn't get a copy of our church bulletin, make sure you do before you go today. We're going to have a closing word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us. I'm grateful for the one, at least one example of a godly person in Hezekiah's life. I'm grateful for the godly examples in my life. And I know that I've got some family members that I desperately want to be that godly influence for. Thank you for your presence here with us today. Bless us as we go from this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.